You know, I got an email uh, just the other day that I thought I would like to address here on the air and um, from Pete. He said, Steve, everywhere I turn, I keep hearing that amillennialism or preterism or replacement theology or whatever is anti-Semitic by nature. I know you are identified with these views. Are you anti-Semitic? And do, you, do these views encourage or require one to be anti-Semitic? Um, well, this is, a, I think, a, a much misunderstood thing. There's nothing about any of those views. And by the way, they're not all the same views. Amillennialism is a view uh, about the millennial reign of Christ, uh, which was held by most Christians throughout history and is an independent belief from, say, preterism or, or partial preterism. I'm not a full preterist, but a partial preterist is somebody who sees the book of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse a certain way, namely that they see it as uh, principally discussing uh, or predicting the fall of Jerusalem. Now, you could be an amillennialist without being a preterist, and many amillennialists have been. For example, Martin Luther and John Calvin, they were uh, amillennial, but they were not preterist. And uh, Abraham Kuyper uh, was uh, amillennial, uh, but not preterist. He was, he was a futurist. <clears throat> Luther and Calvin were historicists. In other words, there's different views of the book of Revelation, which a person who's amillennial could hold, or a person who's postmillennial could hold. It's true that if you're pre-millennial, you're probably going to be a futurist about the book of Revelation. But if you're amillennial or postmillennial, you could take any number of views. So partial preterism is not joined at the hip with any millennial view. But they are often linked together by their critics. And then, of course, you mentioned replacement theology. Uh, replacement theology is a term that nobody I know uses unless they are against it. Um, the truth is that re what... what what dispensationalists refer to as replacement theology is a doctrine that was held by all the church fathers, and dispensationalists mentioned this. Uh, I have a book by David Hawking on replacement theology. I have other books about replacement theology, and, and they're critical of replacement theology, but they admit that as soon as the apostles were dead, this is what the church began to teach, that the earliest church fathers were uh, teaching the doctrine that they are now calling replacement theology. This was also the church's view in the medieval period and in the Reformation. And it's still the view of a very large percentage of churches today. In fact, almost everybody who isn't replacement theology, as they use that term, <clears throat> is usually a dispensationalist or a quasi-dispensationalist, because dispensationalism is pretty much the view that, uh, that decided that so-called replacement theology was a bad thing. Now, what is replacement theology? Now, if you hear it from a, somebody who uses that term, they're always a critic of it, uh, they will say, this means that the church replaced Israel. Well, there's a sense in which that may be considered to be true, but it certainly isn't the most accurate or enlightening definition of the term. More enlightening would be to say, it's the view that the new covenant has replaced the old covenant. Israel remains the same. Israel was serving God under the old covenant, but then the new covenant came and replaced that, and now they serve, the true Israel serves God under the new covenant. Uh, Paul compares it to one woman having two marriages, that is two covenants. In Romans chapter 7, he says we were married to the law. Okay, that was the, the people of God were relating to God through the covenant, like marriage covenant, of, of the law. But then he said we died to the law through the body of Christ so that we'd be married to another, even him that is risen from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. So, in other words, there's a new covenant that has replaced the old covenant. Same woman, same, same people. The people of God once related to God through the Sinaitic covenant. Today, the real people of God relate to him through the new covenant. That's, that's the more accurate way to put it. And it's hardly controversial because everyone knows that the people of God were under the old covenant in the Old Testament. And then anyone who reads the New Testament is aware that Hebrews 8.13 says, where there's a new covenant, the old covenant is obsolete. Okay, so you don't have two covenants, two marriages at the same time. That's why Paul said that the woman who takes a second husband while her first husband's still living is committing adultery. Now, he's not giving a teaching about adultery he's, or marriage or divorce. He's, he's giving a teaching about two covenants, which historically the people of God have related to God through. In the Old Testament times, they were under the covenant of the law. Now they're under the covenant of Christ, the new covenant. 
It's like a new marriage. It's a new covenant. And you can't have both of them at the same time. Paul said that would be adultery. So this is, a, uh, it, to my mind, this is why this view is never considered controversial from the time of the apostles until the 1800s when dispensationalism arose to challenge it, say, no, this is not true. Now, dispensationalism mistakenly says the church replaces Israel. That's not true. But, but this is why they say that this doctrine, which, again, we don't call it <coughs> replacement theology, it's called supersessionism. The, the, the new covenant superseded the old covenant. So it's superseding, supersession of the covenants. This is not anti-Semitic. It is saying that the Jewish people and Gentile people can be the people of God. At one time, Jews and Gentiles could be the people of God under the old covenant. When God made the covenant at Mount Sinai, he, he strictly, uh, I mean, not strictly, he, he made it very clear that uh, the Gentiles could be part of this. He said, if any stranger who lives among you wants to be circumcised and keep the law, then he'll be like a stranger, or like a native of the land. In other words, you don't have to be Jewish to be one of God's people under the old covenant. Same is true in the new covenant. So the point is, you were God's people if you were faithful to the current covenant. And when it was the old covenant, those who were under the old covenant, whether Jew or Gentile, were God's people and were called Israel. Under the new covenant, the same is true. You can be Jewish or Gentile, but if you're faithful to the new covenant, uh, you're, you're God's people, you're Israel. And so Paul compares Israel to an olive tree, which he, uh, an image he gets from Jeremiah, from Jeremiah eleven sixteen, where Israel is compared to an olive tree with branches broken off. And Paul said, well, yeah, there are branches that are broken off of Israel right now, off that olive tree. That's because of their unbelief in Christ. But of course, the believing Jews have not been broken off. Only the unbelieving branches have been. The believing branches remain. They haven't been replaced. The tree hasn't been replaced. Israel is the tree. And the branches that are faithful to the covenant are the ones that stay attached to the tree. The ones that were unfaithful to the covenant and rejected the Messiah, they have been broken off the tree. But Gentiles, some Gentiles have been uh, faithful to the covenant and they've been grafted into the tree. The tree is Israel and it's comprised of branches, Jewish and Gentile, who are defined not by their race, but by their faith. And that's the whole teaching of the New Testament is that people are not commended to God by who their ancestors were, but they're commended to God by who they are and what their relationship with God is. And that would be, of course, faith in Christ. There's nothing anti-Semitic about that because it doesn't say anything different about Jews than about Gentiles. In fact, it says Jews and Gentiles are pretty much, well, they're, they're the same. If they're in Christ, they're equal. There's no Jew or Gentile in Christ. And if they're not in Christ, they're equally lost. They're not part of the covenant. So that's not anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic means against Semites. Now, I just want to say this before I move on to, because we have some callers. But um, just the other day, I just stumbled upon a discussion between Candace Owens and a, a Rabbi Barclay who had accused her of being anti-Semitic. In fact, he had written an article against her calling her a Jew-hating bigot. Now, she had never said anything against Jews. Uh, she didn't give any evidence of being a Jew-hater. What did she say? Well, she said that in the conflict in the Middle East, she wants to look at it level-headedly. She wants to realize, you know, wants to analyze it to see who's doing wrong and who's doing right before she just kind of follows the crowd in making a statement about it. Now, to my mind, that's what I've always said, too. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't support a nation just because you like them. Uh, you support their actions or not, depending on whether they are just and good actions or not. Same thing with our own country. We don't support our country no matter what it does. There are things that are unjust that our country does, and we don't, we're not supportive of that. Same thing with Israel or, or the Palestinians or whoever. Ukraine, Russia, you name it. We evaluate people not by their country, but by their actions. That's how God evaluates people. And so that's what Christians do. But because Candace Owens had not come right out and just uh, spoken you know, solidly as a loyalist to Israel, Rabbi uh, Barclay said that she was a Jew-hating bigot. Now, what's to my surprise, I've heard even Dennis Prager, whom I like a lot, I've heard Dennis Prager say that if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. And this is very confusing. 
And because, uh, uh, you know, for example, a person like myself, and I think Candace Owens is probably in the same boat, never had a bad thought about Jewish people as Jews. Now, there are some Jewish people like Judas Iscariot, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud. There's some Jews uh, that I think were pretty bad people, but I could name even more Gentiles who are bad people. This has nothing to do with being against Jews. It has been against badness. Now, Rabbi Barclay said, well, anti-Semitism is an evolving term. He said it originally was being against the Jewish religion, but it evolved into being against the Jewish people by race. And now it means being against the state of Israel. Now, wait a minute. That, if you want to be uh, not called an anti-Semite, you need to keep up to date with the changing definitions. You can be judged for being anti-Semite by saying all people, Jews and Gentiles, are equal. And this is exactly the same as if in the days when BLM was in the news, if you said all lives matter, that wasn't good enough. It's not good to say all lives matter because that's a white supremacist thing to say. You have to say black lives matter. But of course, all lives matter. And that's the Christian thing to say because it's true. Likewise, if we say, well, do you think Jews are, uh, you know, are specially loved by God? I think, well, Jesus died for the whole world, so the whole world must be specially loved by God. You know, Jews and Gentiles. No, 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 but you have to say the Jews are better, more loved by God. He has, you know, they're specialer than other people. Well, how about if I just say all people are beloved by God? All people need Jesus. That's not good enough. If you're not placing Jews in a higher position than everyone else, you're a bigot. Now, let me just clear this up. If anti-Semitism means being against somebody's religion, the Jewish religion, well, I'm not against people who have the wrong religion. I'm against their religion. It's an anti-Christian religion. Judaism hates, I mean, read the Talmud if you want to find out. It hates Jesus. Um, conservative Jews in this country, uh, they're, they're very tolerant of evangelicals because evangelicals are their biggest supporters. But their Talmud that they've, the Orthodox Judaism follows hates Jesus calls him a sorcerer and a, and a, and a bastard, okay? Uh, that's not very friendly toward Jesus. So the Jewish religion and the Muslim religion and the Buddhist religion are all false religions, and I'm against those religions. I'm not against people who hold them. I'm not, I, I don't hate people who hold that religion, but I'm, I'm, I don't agree with the religion. Does that make me anti-Semite? Well, now what if we change it over from their religion to their race, because Jews can be known either by race or by religion. Well, I, you know, anti-Semite means being against a Shemite, somebody who's descended from Shem. <clears throat> uh, I'm not against people who are descended from Shem. I'm not against people as a group who are descended from anybody. I don't care what race somebody is. I believe all lives matter. Uh, I'm not a racist. I don't place one race above another just kind of de facto because they are of that race. That is not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti Jewish at all, either religion or race. I don't believe their religion is true, but I don't hate people who have that religion or who have that race. In fact, all the original Christians were Jewish. How could any Christian be against the Jewish race? Jesus is of the Jewish race. Well, then what about the Israeli thing, if you're an anti-Zionist? Well, I'm not anti-Zionist, but I don't necessarily affirm that Zionism is a move of God. I think that Zionism is a political movement, and it needs to be evaluated just like any other political movement, including our own. Our own country has to be evaluated uh, politically on its merits and its demerits. And I believe that about Israel too. Uh, I don't think it's anti-Semitic to, to hold certain political opinions. I don't think it's anti-Semitic to say, I disagree with the Jewish religion. And to say that the Jewish race is the same as anybody else is the opposite of anti-Semitic, it's the opposite of racist. And therefore there's nothing about these positions, these theological positions, that translates into anti-Semitism. There is something about dispensationalism, though, that requires you to say Jews are better or in some way more special to God, closer to God's heart, than Gentiles are. And you simply won't find Jesus or Paul agreeing with that anywhere in the Bible at all. So that's not anti-Semitic. It's just, you know, just agreeing with what Jesus said and what Paul said and so forth. It it may disappoint people who want you to put Jews on a pedestal, but you don't have to put people on a pedestal to be, to love them, to be friendly toward them, and to have no hatred toward them. So these people who are telling you that 
these uh, eschatological views are, uh, you know, anti-Semitic, uh, they're using words to their own advantage, uh, you know, just to make their theological points sound more right. Um, in fact, I've some some major advocates of Zionism, and Christian ones, I've heard have compared compared amillennialism with Hitler. But there's no comparison. Amillennialism does not advocate any uh, harm to be done to Jewish people. Hitler did. That's a very different thing. It's not in the same universe as uh, you know biblical theology. Hitler was not following biblical theology. He might have been anti-Semitic, but it wasn't for biblical reasons. He didn't care what the Bible said. He was 